One, two, one, two. <clears throat> Thank you all. Hi, um, I'm Seamus Haji. Some of you may know of me, you may not. I DJ produce, run a label called Big Love, uh, do a radio show on Juice, put on events, work with the BMC, and I do a bit of music business part-time lecturing at some universities. So today's producer Q&A, we've got a great all-star panel lined up, and I'm going to let them introduce themselves and tell you what they do. We're going to start with Paul. Hello, I'm Paul Hartnell, and I'm from Orbital. Um, I'm James from Proc and Fitch. Uh, we make uh, house records, tech house records. I'm, I'm just doing what you should have done. <laughs> and um, yes, yeah, legend, oh, well, orbital legend, yeah. basically. I'm nothing compared to this guy sitting so sat next to you. Um, but yeah, we've been working together for uh, nine years, and uh, uh, we DJ and tour. That's what we mostly do, um, aside from being in the studio. And um, yeah, that's it. I'm Claire. Um, I used to be in a duo called Himself Her, and we made like deep housey stuff. We released on Crosstown Rebels. I'm now working solo, hence I'm called Just Her. Um, and I own a label called Constant Circles as well, which does music and visual art. So yeah, that's it. Hello, my name's Ridney. Today I'll be playing the role of high contrast who couldn't <laughs> be here. I work for Cafe Mambo in Ibiza. Been making records for 18 years. They've been on Defected, Azuli, uh, Steve Angelo's Size Nervous, recently Tall Room, and Steve Max Dysfunctional. And I am nothing compared to Mr. Hartnell. <laughs> Brilliant. Thanks. See, I just learned something. I himself have been playing that, so I didn't know it was you. Uh, yeah. So now I know. Okay, brilliant. Um, so the first question I've got is, um, what was the biggest challenge when you first started producing? We'll start with Paul. Biggest challenge? I, I think just f sort of finding somewhere to get your music out, finding someone to listen to you. You know, I came from a small village in Kent. Noth you know, no connection whatsoever. It's, it's getting to know people, I think, is the biggest challenge, I would say. And I, through a chain of various people that sort of worked in pirate radio, got in touch with Jazzy M and of course he was in touch with Pete Tong and then ended up you know getting chime out through Jazzy M's Ozone label and then getting licensed to Pete Tong so it really was you know without that little chain it, it, it would have you know floundered nowhere I, sh I should imagine it's definitely you know you've just got to find a route in I think with with people as well as you know having music at your disposal. Well, there are people you were trying to emulate so you know was there a challenge in making the music that you had in your mind, or was that part of it easy? It was more about getting it out there. Uh, no, making the music was it was easy in in that sense. You know what I mean? I'd sort of been doing a lot of electronic music anyway before house music came along. When that came along, I really enjoyed it because it was a kind of combination of electro, which I'd loved, and high energy music, and it was like someone had kind of put the two together, and it seemed to be you know, sort of building a momentum. And for me, it, I, I felt I wanted to hear something sort of heavier, so kind of went in thinking, I oh, know, I need to do it like this, and found a little hole in the, you know, in the jigsaw, I suppose, and thought that's, that's what I wanted. And then when I heard kind of Detroit techno, it was like, there you go. That's, that's what I've been yeah. waiting for, you know. Never been a big fan of the sort of the piano and soul -y stuff. You know, some great stuff like that, but that wasn't really my bag. I was coming more from industrial kind of music and craft work and that kind of thing. Uh, so for me, the main challenge was um, not being from an incredibly, well, say, musical background, but to be able to play instruments and what have you. Um, producing stuff was very much learning, you know, how it should sound. You know, I, I still don't really me read music now, but if something sounds good, I, I know it sounds good, you know. And I think... One of the first challenges uh, for me from the start was I was w w working with a, a producer who used to make a lot of records in the 80s, a lot of disco and, and stuff like that, and he taught me how to produce. Um, but we never really used to be able to finish anything, and even though I was observing to start with, I really just wanted to kind of get my hands on it and, uh, you know, and, and try and finish stuff. So it wasn't until I stopped working with him and uh, moved back to the UK because I was living in Spain at the time. Um, but I actually started to, to write stuff and, and, and Ben and I actually, the first record that we wrote and finished together, um, he was DJing with Roger Sanchez and gave it to him that night 
and he phoned us up the next day and said, I love this record, I want to sign it. And uh, it kind of went from there, really. But just to re kind of rephrase what you said about the hardest thing about... I'm, I'm just trying to remember the question in my head to make sure I've answered it, to be honest, because I've realised it's been like rambling What was on. the biggest challenge when you first started producing, yeah? Yeah, so it was finishing stuff and just having the confidence to know that it was right, not being from a musical background. Yeah, both of those things apply to me as well, but I think the main thing for me was trying to make things sound how they sounded in my head. Because when you're first starting out, you know what you want to sound like, but it's really difficult to actually create that from scratch. And that was one of the biggest things. And there's, there's a quote that I've, I read somewhere, I can't remember where I got it from now, about this creative gap where the things that you're making just aren't quite as good as your taste, but you've got to trust that your taste is the thing that's getting you where you want to go, you know, and you've just got to trust that. And you've got to put out a volume of work, so each time you make something, it's that little bit better. And it's not necessarily new techniques or new things that you're learning. It's just your ears, you know, developing each time you make something. And I think you've really got to put the time in, make a volume of work until you get to that point where you're almost how you want to sound. I think I'm only just getting there now after, like, 10 years of, of production. And I still don't think I'm quite there. Um, and it's also finding the time to do that as well when you've got to pay the bills during the day. I know most people, if you're starting out as producers, you're working probably a nine-to-five, and then you've got to find that time and energy to put in at the end of the day to, pr to produce and to learn as well. And I think it's Mike Monday that puts post stuff out about that, about learning and production. And he was saying, if you can try and get up an hour earlier each day and do something when you're fresh in the morning, you know, when you first wake up and you've not been making decisions all day and tiring your brain, um, then even if you just do that hour a day, you can create more v a volume of work. So, yeah, that's the main thing for me. Is that good? <laughs> Uh, when I started out, I was trying to copy Seamus, to be honest. <laughs> uh, the thing that changed my life in 99 was Reason 1.0. And um, I'd been DJing a l quite a while, and it was experimenting with that that got me you know, to make, make some records. And the biggest challenge, I hear what Paul's saying, is actually getting that music then out to people. You know, I pressed a couple of times 500 white labels, and you got to drive around the shops back in the day and... You know, some people would take the record and some people would say it's absolute shit. You know, and you've got, you've got to be able to take that. Do you know what I mean? So, yeah, um, it, it's hard, it was hard and you just, you know, carry on through, through all the software and keep learning exactly as you say, Claire. Just keep learning all the time and try and make a record better than your last one. So, yeah, it's good to... Um, I guess have aspirations and emulate people and try and get your sound as best as you can and you're learning as you go along, right? And then trying to get it into the right hands of people for it to do what it can do. So um, another thing, how do you deal with the pressure of sort of constantly releasing music to get gigs because it's getting more and more like that? Um, do you feel the pressure affects your uh, creativity? we start with you, Paul. Um, what do you mean? What, like, sort of, do you need to get new stuff out there? In, yeah, in order yeah. To, to get gigs. Well, you do. I mean, and it's funny because when I first started 27 years ago, you made a record and that's how you made your money and you did gigs to promote the record. <laughs> Completely the opposite way around now. You make a record to show that you're still current and doing something and then people book you for gigs, you know. Um, which begs the question, where did all that money go from the gigs early on? <laughs> I don't know. Where, where, what happened to that? But um, no, it's, it's... I don't know. I, I find... I find you just have to listen to yourself, just make, make the music you want to make, you know. I've, I've gone down that route of thinking, what do people want to hear from me? And it's just a disaster, because you kind of end up second-guessing and going around in this kind of ridiculous feedback loop of trying to imagine what people want to hear. And it's like, what they want to hear is what you want to put out, because that's why they like you in the first place, you know. But I guess, you know, if you're touring constantly, like, I don't know how you will work individually. Some people, like Eric Prids, sort of, writes music while he's touring, doesn't he? He yeah. doesn't like flying, he's on trains for a long time. Um, I so think it's a good thing to do, though. I, I like yeah. doing that. It, yeah. Because I, I find, I get on a plane or a train, I think, oh, I've got an hour. Let's see if I can knock up a quick track. And actually, that's how you, you come up with something quite free and easy, and you know, you're not really thinking about what it is. You're just setting yourself a little task to do something quickly. Like, like you say, getting up in the morning and doing something quickly. My best time is first thing in the morning. I get really frustrated if I start my sort of writing process after 11 in the morning, I kind of feel like I've lost the day. Mm. I think there's a certain psychological pressure when you have a big record 
to then follow it up. You know, um, we had a record that was uh, that was number one on Beatport for nearly ten weeks. Um, the uh, Sheeple. Sheeple, with Green Sheeple Velvet, track with yeah. Green Velvet, yeah. And um, after making that record, everyone's very much waiting to hear what you're going to do next. And um, I think some people cope people cope differently under that kind of pressure. You know, do you try and write something that you know follows that up, or do you just keep doing? As Paul said, you just do what you do. You know, and um, I think we had an EP that followed that up and you instantly assume that because you've had a big record, you know, you're going to have another one, but it, it really doesn't work like that. And I think the important thing is to remove yourself from that record and just not write another record that you love, you know, and not try and put the pressure on yourself to write another big record. But it's funny because the records, our records that always tend to be the most successful are the ones we sit down to write a B-side for a record that we think is the strongest. And that B-side always, always ends up turning into the A-side. And that's because there's no pressure. We're doing what we love. We just, you know, we're, we're just kind of rolling with it. We get a vibe and then we finish it. And we're like, well, that wasn't what we set out to do. But it just goes to show when you take the pressure off, you know, you, you definitely become more creative because there's no expectations. Yeah, I suffer from this quite a lot, actually. Um, I've got a manager who kind of gives me goals to produce a certain amount of music a week because from his point of view, the market's so saturated now you need to be putting music out there. You need to be in the public eye to sell tickets to the gigs to get booked, you know, and bookers aren't going to want you if you're not releasing consistently. Um, so he kind of says he wants me to make a track a week, at least possibly two, and I can't work like that. Like, I do vocal stuff and I take my time on it. And when I'm put under that pressure, I'm sitting in the studio thinking, I've got to get this track finished this week, and then it just, nothing comes out and it, it's just shit. So... Yeah, it's a really tricky one. I think there's got to be a balance between <clears throat> how much you make and not kind of overexposing yourself and making yourself watered down. I think there's a lot of artists that are just putting out so much music that it kind of starts sounding a little bit the same. I'm not going to mention any names or anything. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, but there's also, um, for me, the difficulty is getting the tracks out there on the bigger labels. There's such a waiting list now I mean, like, the track that we did on Crosstown <clears throat> was about 18 months from when they signed it to when it actually was released. So, and my manager's saying to me, with a lot of the big labels now, it's going to be like that. It's going to be 10 months to a year from when it's signed to when it actually goes out there. And that's one of the reasons why I started my label, because I just thought, you know what, I just want control over that. I want to be able to make something and then, if it, you know, get it out there as soon as I can, because I want it to be fresh as well when it's being released. So... That's definitely made a big difference to me, is having my own label and having control over that, how much music I can release and when I can release it. Yeah. Yeah, it's good, it's having control over it. Yeah, it makes yeah. sense. Yeah. Paul? I maybe buck the trend a little here. I mean, I just, I make records for my DJ set and if anything else happens, it's a bonus, you know? The, the records that have done well for me have been stuff that has been done for fun and people pick it up and it, it goes a bit bonkers. I mean, it, you know, anything that you sit down and try and make it sound f won't do as well as something you do for fun for your DJ sets. I mean, one particular record I did with James Talk, a record called Forever. He called me from Australia, right, we're sampling Earth, Wind and Fire, let's do this thing. We did it. We started playing it and the record went absolutely bonkers. And we just, play, you know, played it in our sets and the phone rang, you know, that, that was it. And I would say to you guys, make records for fun. Anything that comes off it is an absolute bonus. You know, don't, don't do it, you know, for the wrong reason. Good. Um, so <clears throat> another question I've got is, how do you feel um, with creative block and doubts in the studio? I could start with you if you want, Ridley, we, we'll come back this way. So if you want to start with lines, like, how do you deal with, uh, yeah, creator's block? Do something completely different to what you'd normally do. You know, sometimes if you make tech house, make a chill out record, make a drum and bass record, just make something completely different. Just, just set yourself a different challenge. You know, I, I'm probably different to most people in that I try not to make the same style of records all the time. I like making tech house, I like making French house, I like making down tempo to play at Mambo. You know, if, I, if I'm sat there and I'm banging my head on the table, just start with a completely new project, change the BPM, 
to 98 instead of 123, 124. Just do something different. And that usually, oh, yeah, that might work in a something else track. You know, just try something different. Pretty much the same, really, to be honest. I'll do that. And if I'm not feeling something, I won't continue with it for too long. I'll just park it. Um, and sometimes if I'm stuck, I'll just kind of listen through other people's music and just not copying, but just getting inspiration from different sounds and different styles and ideas that they've used and then just listen through and then go back to what I was doing. And then also going back to old projects as well, things that I've left that I've forgotten about and then I suddenly reopen them and it's like sounding fresh again and then you've got a starting point to work from there. So, yeah. I think it's slightly different coming from a duo because when there's two of you, as you probably know from your experience, yeah. if one of you's got the block, maybe the other one's got the, you know, the cre creative juices flowing. But there's definitely been a time where we did have a block and I think we didn't put a record out for maybe six months. Um, but it did tie in with us coming back um, fresh and creating something new that we've kind of built on a, a, again from. But we just tend to just listen to music, try and get inspiration, um, just trawl through sample packs until we can find maybe a bit of inspiration that we can't find ourselves by playing stuff. And listening to music is so important, you know, as, as, as you said as well, you, you, you do get inspiration from things, even if it's just like a little vocal hook that you think and you end up sampling it and you put it into the record and then you take it out afterwards. I think, it, it, you know, there's nothing wrong with getting inspiration from your favourite producers or like a piece of music that you really like. And I think we all do it and it's important to, to have that. But we, yeah, whenever we've had a block, we've just spent the whole day on YouTube listening to, you know, old house records and, you know, stealing things from them. <laughs> yeah, all, all of the above, really, you know. Um, I think just change tack if something's not working. So, I mean, sometimes the only different thing that I would do, every, you know, all of, all good methods, all things that, that I do, and sometimes doing things like, you know, I had a massive one in the 90s, I couldn't do anything for ages, and then just grabbed a stylophone and only sampled sounds from a stylophone, whether that's pulling the cable in and out, just clicking it and things like that, and just made a whole track with that, and that just totally broke the kind of, you know, the, the stuckness, because you... Yeah. You, you have limit, limitation, actually. The, the, I think often, sort of with electronic music, the palette is so wide, sometimes you just get lost in, in option. And I think just remove everything else, look at one piece of equipment, and, and say, right, you, I'm going to do it all with that. And all of a sudden, you're, you're, you're struggling to make what you need out of it, and that's part of the fun. That becomes the fun, you know. And, it, of course, you listen back to something. You made a whole track out of a stylophone. You've got a really weird drum kit going on there, but it's kind of different and, and it's something else you know um, that's that's kind of sort of thing I do I just restrict myself to only samples of odd sounds or whatever or, or go out in, in the real world with a recorder record some strange things and say right that's that's it that's my sound palette you know that kind of thing it's cool so um, I know some of you worked as you worked as duo before you worked as a duo with uh, James Talk, obviously, and Prognovich. Um, let's say you're working on your own. What about if you have a sort of self-doubt? What would you do in that situation if you're not sure? You think something's good, but you're just not... You're doubting it for various reasons. Time to have a cup of tea. Stop taking yourself too seriously, I think. You know, because the doubt... What I find is you normally get a rush of creativity. It normally starts with me around sort of 8.30, in the morning around sort of coming towards lunchtime, exactly that, the, the doubt, oh, does that sound a bit like Nine Inch Nails? Or does that sound a bit like, oh, is that, is that a bit like something I've done before? As soon as that happens, you just go, ah, oh, there it is. It's the, you know, the creativity stopped now. That's my rush of creativity, it's done. Go and have a cup of tea, chat with some people, don't listen to it, you know, come back in an hour or so and listen to it and go, oh, I know. And all of a sudden the doubt's gone and you come back to it. Because the, the doubt, it's just, it's really unhelpful and unnecessary. You know, you've done a creative act, that's, that's it. You know, it's like, like you said, nothing's ever perfect. I'm still looking for the perfect song. Every time I write, start something, I think, oh, this is it. And of course, when you get to the end, it's like, nah, it's all right. I'll do another one. You know, and if, you, if you'd got the perfect song, you'd stop, wouldn't you? You know, who's ever done that? But would you, um, would you send stuff to friends or peers to get their opinion on something? 
Um, I like playing stuff to people, yeah. And there, there are certain people that I would trust and have trusted in the past that you think, oh, I'm going to play it to them. Or if it's a certain type of track, you might play it to this person or whatever. But I kind of do less of that now, I think. I think I, f I do feel more sort of sure-footed about it. It's just like, do I like it? Yeah, I like it. It's great. You know. Um, but I will play stuff, you know, in front of... What I find, actually, is just playing stuff in front of other people, maybe having a beer around your house, a couple of people... And then you see how, don't worry about how they feel, but notice if people start nodding and tapping or someone goes like that to look at what's playing. But see how you feel, because if you've, if you've got a, you know, a real bum track, you just get totally embarrassed and you just think, oh, God, I want it to end. You know, and you know that, that there's, there's something wrong with it or you just feel it's too long or you, just, you instantly hear the problems when you play it in front of other people, I think. Yeah, we, we, like part of our creative process is um, we have two people we'll always send stuff to. Um, and we'll work on various different grooves. So we'll be working on... Is that like A&R manager or your manager? Yeah, manager and, and a, a friend also who does the same with his music he makes. He's got two different guys um, and they're both quite successful. And um, we've always um, kind of A&R'd for each other. Um, we understand each other's music and... Uh, We'll always be working on three or four grooves at the same time because we find that that's, that allows us to be more creative rather than just sitting down trying to finish one thing. If you go to something else and then come back to it, then you find that you've learned something from that other track and you put it into that. So we'll work on grooves and just get to like a 16-bar phase where there's maybe a little idea for what the break will be like and then the groove and all the elements in there and just bounce it and send it to these two people who, um, you know, you ring them up and it's like, quick, quick, you can, you can listen to it, you can listen to it. And we do it for each other and we always do. So that's always for us, it's, it's a good gauge as to whether we're kind of in the right vibe. And at the end of the day, it's us that makes the decision on, you know, whether we finish something or whether it's strong enough. But it's always nice to have that fresh input from someone that's never heard it. That, as you said, you're sat there and you think it's wicked because you've been working on it all day. You know, well, sometimes it's shit, you know, and there isn't any point in finishing some records, you know. So, yeah, that's, that's kind of how we work, and it, it works really well because we're always questioning each other, you know, you know, is that right, is that right? And just by giving it to someone else and then being honest with you, that's the important thing is if you're going to send stuff to people, they have to be people that you're okay with them slating what you're doing because not everything is great, you know, and you need to hear that, you know, because if you, if you play stuff to your friends, they're always like, yeah, that's really good. They don't want to hurt your feelings, but you need people that will be 100% brutally honest with you because it really does help. Yeah, I think the self-doubt thing is, it's kind of always there for me in the background. Um, and I think that kind of comes with the territory of being an artist and creating something that you're then putting out in front of the whole world and opening it up to criticism. So there's always that kind of worry of everything that I make, are people going to like it? But I think it's just not letting that ever take over. That's the important thing, you know, just, just keeping it under control. And I think it's kind of a good thing to be worried because it means that you're really caring about, you know, what you're creating and you're putting a lot of passion into it. Um, so yeah, and I mean, I came from a duo, obviously, and it, I have noticed the difference from going working in a duo to going solo in terms of not having that kind of second opinion or person to just bounce ideas past. Um, but I quite like it because I like the fact that it comes down to me, and I've got to make those deci decisions. Um, and then the other thing is, since I've had the label, I've kind of built like a just a small little community of, of producers that work with me, and we all send each other everything all the time for feedback you know and we play each other's tracks and test them out before we send them to labels or before we release them so i do think that's really important yeah i agree with um with what everyone's saying really especially claire and paul i mean you know i've got ideas sometimes no you you know what I mean you you park you work on an idea you park it you have a cup of tea you come back and and see what it's like and sometimes those ideas are great Sometimes they're absolute shit. You know, that's, that's life. You know, um, yeah, I, I, much the same as the other guys for me. So, it's, okay, so it could be yourself, like the self-doubt thing. You could just check yourself, take a break for a while. It could be bouncing off the ideas of somebody or sending it to peers to get their opinion. And then the next step is, I guess, if you're DJing and then, or performing it live, is, is testing in front of crowds, isn't it? To get their reaction. Uh, and making 
changes if you need to to the arrangement or the sonics. Um, what's been the biggest learning curve as a producer? I'll start with you, Paul. Oh, I don't. I'm not actually sure. I think one of the biggest skills, which I'm kind of twisting the the, the question because I don't know what the biggest learning curve <laughs> is, but I think one of the biggest skills that I, that I see that is important is, is knowing when to finish, is being able to finish. You know, I see a lot of people floundering with albums that take five years to write because they actually rewrite the whole album over and over again. And certain tracks, you say, oh, that's good. And then they play it to you two months later and, the, and you say, what happened to that other track? Oh, that's, that is that track, you know, and it's, what have you done? If, and it's like that, that thing of, you get bored of what you do, you know, so you, of course you do. Sometimes when you labour on a track, you kind of get bored with it and then you tempt, the temptation is to change it. What I think is that the real skill is to go, no, I'm going to finish that, that idea is that idea, that's it, finished. But all these other ideas I'm having, I'm going to put into the next track, you know. And I think finishing, learning to finish is a really big, big skill, I think. I think for us it would probably be evolving because music changes so quickly and there's always so many um, new influences that it's important to stay current but at the same time still keep your own sound and your own identity. So, yeah, I, so I think evolving, learning new production techniques, you know, things, things are changing so quickly that um, I kind of lost the track of where I was going with this. Um, <laughs> But I think that yeah, our biggest challenge is definitely evolving. We've been producing together for nine years, so you know, nine years on, you want your records to be sounding different to how they how they were. And I think some producers get caught in this rut of making the same record again and again and again. And you touched on this earlier on. You know, you get a formula and it works, and you can regurgitate that a certain number of times. But then, you know, where do you go after that to still satisfy your fans and still? do what your other records were doing, but keeping it fresh and, and current? Um, for me, it's the biggest learning curve was the kind of the technology side of this business. So it's not just about writing music anymore, it's about actually learning the tools to be able to create those sounds. And actually, you don't just need to be a musician, you need to be kind of a massive geek, basically. Uh, it's a lot of science, it's a lot of maths. Um, and your point, Paul, about limitation earlier, is, I think that's really, really key. Um, somebody early on gave me a really good piece of advice about that, which was when I was first asking for advice on what do I build my studio from, you know, do I need hardware, what do I need? And they said, just get the absolute minimum to start with, you know, just get a computer, get logic and a controller keyboard and learn that, learn it until you know everything in it and then maybe add some plugins, and then when you've learned that, maybe add a piece of hardware. And I actually did that, and I think it's worked really well, because I didn't, you can get a bit overwhelmed with, you know, especially with the hardware side of things, people building these massive studios and then don't use any of it. Um, and it is time consuming using hardware as well. So I think gradually doing that over the last 10 years of me producing has actually really helped me get to, you know, to where I want to be, so. Yeah, I would say try different stuff, you know. Um, try a different bit of hardware. You know, I've used GarageBand sometimes just for ideas because there's different synths. You know, I predominantly use Ableton. I'm just looking for something different. You know, what's, what's going to influence me with a new idea? You know, is it a bit of software? I, I, I just, it's constantly evolving. It's not relying on the same stuff the whole time. You know, I can sit there and do the same stuff with Ableton. Sometimes I think, well, oh, I just need something different. And I wanted different synth sound, so I thought GarageBand, that'll do. It's installed. I've never used it. And an idea came from that, you know, bounced it all straight back into Ableton, start an idea in Ableton. It's just, you know, mm. that, that's the biggest learning curve. Uh, you know, as Claire says, keep up to date with software as well, because it's changing constantly. The amount of times Reason change their updates and there's new stuff in there, you know, and all that new stuff does wicked things each time that you load it up, you know? Wow. So, yeah. Okay. Um, so one other question I've got, and then we'll have 10 minutes where we can open the, the floor out for the audience to ask questions. Um, it's a bit of a cliche question, but it's always a good one. So what advice would you give your younger self now? If you look back and you were going to speak to your younger self, what advice would you give to yourself when you first started out as a producer? I wish you were going last on this one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe I can. Would you, 
Right, right. Paul's going to start. Okay. Don't do it. <laughs> so stressful, seriously. No, just, you know, uh, as Claire said, get something and learn it really, really well. You know, as I say, I love Ableton. I feel that I know it really, really, really well. And, uh, and yeah, just, just get something and, and be really, really good at it. But yeah, be prepared for stress if you want to go through it. It is stressful. I don't know, you know, because I'm kind of happy with how it's gone. I don't know if that sounds stupid, but... So I don't really know if I'd give myself any advice. Although, having said that, I have made horrendous mistakes and I've put stuff out that probably should never have heard, seen the light of day and sent demos that shouldn't have been sent. But I think you have to do that. It's, it's part of the journey to get in there. And those things were as important as the good things that happened. So, yeah, I think you've just got to keep rafting and that's it, really. I think take a break now and then. You know, I always kind of, it's that self-employed thing of always thinking, I can't stop, I can't stop. And actually taking a break here and there would have been handy, you know. Um, just for your, just, yeah, yeah, having a life. Just, you know. Um, that and play less computer games, maybe, you know. Well, that's that, yeah. No, I'm, like Claire, I'm actually quite pleased with where I've ended up. So it's, it's kind of, you know, there's mistakes made along the way. Nothing's perfect, but... You know, it, it, it came out pretty well. I'm going to jump on the bandwagon and agree with you two, I think. Because yeah. everything that happens is, is part of who you become. And it is part of your learning curve. And you, everyone makes mistakes. But I think you need to make those mistakes in order to learn from them and change your habits in order to get better. So. Good. All right. Well, yeah. So we've got a bit, bit of time to ask... Uh, you if you've got any questions and I'll start with this guy on the far, far left first please um, what would you say is the basic um, rules of sampling for someone that wants to you know create a track and they really like a sample and they kind of create something really great with it but there's always like limitations on that sample Uh, just all of well, what do you mean when you say make a take a sample? Do you mean if someone else's music or so? Yeah. So for instance, if there's like a really famous sample, or there's something that you you inspired to and you used it and manipulated it to create something that you can yeah. use for your production. What would you say to people as their basic, you know, like knowledgement of how you can use that sample? As in, for instance, that you won't get, you know, done or sued for copyright. Yeah, well, you just got to go if you really want to do it properly. If you th don't think you can get it under the radar, which, to be fair, when I first started, we were getting everything under the radar. But that's that's not just that's just what everybody was doing back then, you know, um, which now has stopped. So I think you've just got to be honest, open, and go and approach them and say, "I've done this. Can I can I do it?" And you find actually most people are flattered and let you do it. Uh, you know, obviously, you might not get any money from it, from the publishing, but nine times out of ten, when you do something like, you know, yeah, okay, well, I've taken a great sample. I know I'm not going to get any publishing, but I want to get it out there. You know, so that's the that's the way to do it. You've just got to be open, honest, and try and get get permission. I think there's a few different approaches to this because um, this is something that that we've done a fair bit, um, and actually, one of the records we sampled was yours. Oh, and, uh, <laughs> Uh oh, <laughs> and, and he didn't sue, and we're still talking. So <laughs> um, that record actually became a remix. It became like an official remix that was, you know, that was approved and um, and came out on a label. Um, there's also um, companies that replay samples, you know, where you don't, you know, obviously get the publishing. Normally, if you sample something directly, then the um, the artist will want um, a chunk of money. But then there's also ways around that by getting things resung, where you just clear the publishing, and it's a, it's a lot simpler to do that than it is to go to the artist. And we've had records where you know we've sampled a vocal from you know an a cappella and the four of mine recently. Remember, and I got a nice check for that. Yeah, yeah, you're yeah. welcome, mate. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and um, um, yeah, and they disapprove it. They don't they don't want it, or they they've already let someone else sample it, and in which case you then have to go back and find something else. Or, um, so I would say don't be, don't be afraid to, sa to sample stuff, but also be very aware that at some point, you know, 
they might close the door on it. But saying that, if you start a record with something that you sampled, you can end up taking that sample out and you've got something that you never would have come up with had that sample not been there in the first place. So, yeah, there's a few different answers for you. Yeah, it's a bit of a grey area, this, isn't it? Um, I've released stuff, quite a few things in the past that have had obvious samples in and the labels have been okay with just doing it illegally kind of thing and, and nothing's ever come of those. Then on the other hand, I did a track with a Koshin, a vocal from Koshin, uh, which we actually just did as a free download and we, we put it as a remix, thinking that, you know, free download, we're not making any money, that's fine. And we had Koshin's management straight on the phone saying, you need to take that down right now, otherwise you're going to court. And I was like, okay, I didn't expect that to happen. Um, so since then, I just kind of decided just to, just to write original stuff, not, not use samples anymore. So unless it's kind of stuff that's royalty free, um, and also, I don't, don't mind saying that I think it's okay to use stuff out of sample packs as well. You were saying that, weren't you? Um, I think people can be a bit too precious about that. You know, it, it doesn't make you unoriginal. If you use it in an original way and you're creating a whole composition and a production around that, then I just don't see the problem with it. Um, but generally speaking, I think it's just a bit of a grey area, so I probably wouldn't take the risk now with trying to release something, I don't think. Yeah, I would just... Add, you know, I've sampled a lot of things in my time, Earth, Wind & Fire, Lionel Richie, Patrice Russian. We've got it all cleared. Uh, be mindful if you're going to sample that you're going to need to probably clear it if it's pretty obvious. Um, be prepared, as, as James said, that people may turn around and say no. I have had more than one occasion where someone said no. So, uh, but, you know, if it's something for your DJ sets and just for you, then, then cool. If you want to release it, just be mindful could be a bloody stressful thing. <laughs> okay, uh, any more questions? We'll go, I'll go to this guy first here, the guy with a white t-shirt, please. Hi, um, would you say it's helpful to separate uh, the production element of the track from like, the mixing? For, for me, it kind of just all blends into one. You know, I, I sort of sit there with... I, well, I don't know. It's, it's, it's a funny. I, I nearly always do combine the whole thing, um, but sometimes I will mentally, if I'm really writing, you know, notes and rhythms and things like that, I will sometimes park the idea of production and think, yeah, I'm going to put a compressor on that later. I won't worry about that, and I'll sit there sort of running around loads of analog synths and doing kind of passes and performances, and then I might sit there, say, after lunch when I'm kind of over the big creative hump, I start thinking technically and sit down and think, okay, let's kind of start pulling this together with the way it sounds. So, you know, it can go either way, but sometimes if you're sort of really on it, your kind of writing and production process sort of blends into the same thing, really. I think there's always a point, though, at the end when you've got your arrangement done, you've got your whole song ready to go, that you do think, right, okay, last bit of fairy dust on the top with the, the mixing, you know. You answered it for me, and it's, pu it's purely personal. I don't think there's a textbook answer. It's purely down to, to how you work. Everyone's different. Everyone has their own way of getting their sound, and I think it's just a purely personal thing. Mm. Um, mixing as I go along, always, uh, same as Paul, really. I don't leave a sound until I'm kind of happy with it in the mix. So the mix, down, the mix down process is happening all the way through the, the creative process. And then once I'm happy with the final track, I'll then just leave it for a couple of days because it's amazing how different it then sounds when you go back to it after you've had like a complete break from it and listen to other stuff. Uh, and then at that point, I'll do a mix down, but it's just, like you say, it's tiny little things, listening to it on a lot of dis different systems as well. Um, and my car, that's the, like the ultimate test, is playing it in my car and how it sounds in my car. Um, and then just going back and making small changes. But yeah, otherwise it's, it's mixing as you go along for me. Agree with everything everyone else has said. <laughs> Cheers. Cool. Okay, let's. Uh, we'll have one from the back. The guy there, the guy in the middle, please, with a white T-shirt. Hello. Um, <clears throat> just going back to uh, what you were saying, Paul, about um, you put on some music and you know you have a few friends around and they listen to it and get get some opinions or whatever. Um, have you ever had situations where um, you re you've made a track, you really really like it, and you play it to a couple of other people and they don't like it? And then you think, well, screw you guys, I really like it, I want to put it out. And if so, what happened? <laughs> that happens to me all the time. That's, you know, 
I, I, especially in the early days, I used to, the, the music that I wanted to make, none of my mates would like it. They'd all sit there getting stoned behind me going, oh, you should try this, you should do that. That needs more piano. And, and I just used to ignore them and get on with it. You know, you might try it, some ideas, but generally speaking, I think if you believe in something, there's a track I've got knocking around. I've had it knocking around for, I think it nearly made it onto the last Orbital album about seven years ago or something like that. You know, and I still really like it and I can't find a home for it, but I, I'm, I'm not giving up on it because I like it. It will get out there. Um, I'll never tell you which one it is, but, you know, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but exactly, yeah. Yeah, you can have a go, get, get it right for me. But um, no, I think if you believe in something, if you like it, you know, you've got to, you know, one or two people isn't, uh, you know, isn't enough anyway. You've just got to, if you believe in it, just get it out there and see if other people like it, you know. I, that, that's what I think. Um, actually, there's no. I'll, I'll, I'll left that question. Yeah, yeah. I had. A, I've had this happen a few times. There was one incident in particular where I made a track that I decided I was going to send to Stillbore Talent, which is it's out on Stillbore Talent now. Um, and I sent it to my manager and said, I want to. I want to send this to Stillbore Talent. And he was like, it had got a vocal on it, me singing a vocal. He's like, it's great, but I think you need to take the vocal off. I just don't think that's the vibe of Stillbore Talent. Take that off, and we'll send it sent it to the label and they replied with we really like the track but we think it's missing something like a vocal maybe <laughs> and I was like unmute the vocal send it again and they signed it so and it's like I think it's with different labels as well it's that kind of one person's opinion at that one time and you shouldn't get too hung up on people saying no because somebody else is probably going to like that track um, nine times out of ten so I've sent EPs to labels where they've just said a flat no and then the next label absolutely love it so yeah, just, just trust yourself, I guess. I can agree with you more. The, the <laughs> one thing that I've learned over the years is an A&R's opinion is one or two people's opinion, you know? It doesn't mean the rest of this room isn't going to absolutely love it. I mean, if you feel, totally feel that it's right, it's right. It's got to be right for you because you're going to put your name to it. So um, you just said exactly what was rattling around my head is... You can get frustrated with sending demos to A&Rs and them say, no, don't like it, it's not right, do this, do that. It's one person's opinion. Send it to another label, send it to another label. Just, just keep, keep trying. But if, if you feel it's ready, man, it's ready. If you, get a if you can DJ anywhere, try it out on a crowd because they'll tell you if it's ready. Thank you. Okay, yeah, yeah. this chap at the left, please, at the front. Hello, I've just got a quick question about mastering. Um, so I just wanted to know each like of your stories. Do you master your tracks yourself? Like, if so, what are your like go-to plugins slash techniques, or do you send it off and like, to a label that you belong to, and they they mix it and master it for you? <laughs> You're sitting next to my master mastering engineer. <laughs> that was my answer. <laughs> It's funny you asked that question, this question came up last year, because there's an assumption that if you have a record signed to Tool Room, that you just send the stems and they mix it down for you, and that's not how it works at all. You know, if everyone finishes their own tracks and um, has someone afterwards that, you know, will run that through their analog gear and, and give it a certain sound. So we finish our records and uh, we work with someone who looks over the mix afterwards and adds an extra 10% to it, you know, and I don't think there's anything wrong with having, you know, a guy that has fresh ears, you know, and is maybe a bit more technical with, with certain things that makes stuff sound better. At the end of the day, you produce the record, you know, you look at these big pop producers, you know, they're singing on their records and they produced it, but they've had some guys sat in a studio for hours and hours on end, getting paid a daily rate. And, um, you know, they're making the stuff sound amazing. So um, it's like an individual process, I think. But there are some great mastering engineers out there that, you know, you can finish your track um, and send it to, and they're listening to it with a totally fresh perspective. So they're, they're making stuff sound, you know, even better than it, it does when it comes out of the studio. Yeah, I, I always... Might get go to a mastering engineer always because it's it's 
you know, you get it sounding as good as you can, and then they kind of do that final polish and balance to make sure it's the right volume, it's the right, it's going to sit right for each format. You know, back back in the day for vinyl, it had to be mastered a certain way. For CD, it could be a bit fatter, things like that. You know, and all these kind of technical details is not something that I, no, you, you could learn it, I guess, but it is that thing of someone else with a fresh set of ears who does this on a daily basis to kind of go, ah, you just need to balance this like this and, and they'll, they'll put it into the, the world of, of released music so that it sounds right on any system you know and I think that's no no they're not precious at all they, don't, they just kind of listen to it and kind of give you some advice and check it with you uh, and the other I think important thing is to always attend the cut I don't I very only only in emergency situations like getting something out quickly do I send something to someone and they send it back and you can you know, to and fro, but you're much better off going there, sitting back on someone's sofa while they do all the technical stuff and they go, do you prefer it like this or like this? And you, oh yeah, and, and it's really good and you can just go, oh, maybe a bit more on, the, and you know, and they can, they can talk you through the process, it's brilliant. And of course, a good master engineer will have the right tools for the job as well, which is not something that I've got. So I, it's just that extra little bit, like you say, you know, that will just polish it off and you'll take it home and listen to it and go, I can't believe I used to like it. I thought that that was finished. You know, it's, it's just that, that little bit of, of, again, another layer of fairy dust never helps. Ne never helps? Never hinders. Sorry. Never helps. Um, yeah, as I said, my mastering engineer is in the, in the crowd, so obviously I get my stuff mastered. But it's difficult one if you're sending out demos because most of the labels that I work with will master the tracks before release. They'll do that themselves. And I do that as a label. But at the same time, if someone's sending me a demo and it's not been mastered, it doesn't have that, it, it, it might not grab me sometimes. So you want them to sound as good as you, as good as you can um, as demos when you send them out to labels. And if at the beginning that means paying somebody to, to master them for you, to give you that sparkle, then maybe that's worth the investment. Um, I feel like I've got to the point now where I can do like a, a home DIY master with, with digital plugins like Waves or Ozone, where I can get it sounding good enough, so almost mastered, to be able to send that as demos. And then if it gets signed, they'll then ask me for like a pre-master file, which is, you know, got the headroom for them to master it themselves for release. Um, but yeah, it's like a mystical art to me. I don't know how the, so the tracks sound so good. Uh, plug in my warm, warm audio mastering is the guy down there, but I think he, you've got like a million bits of kit, right? He's got like crazy gear yeah, in the it's studio. It's expensive, and if you love it, it's like, so it's a completely different thing because obviously you guys stay with the tracks for so long. And yeah. It's that second pair of ears, and for me, I, I take a completely neutral approach to it. So it's, it's uh, you know, there's no, it's like I listen to it for the first time, which helps you guys out, I can give back feedback. Yeah. And, but also, it's like I said, it's, it's sort of like I listen to it for a very long period of time like you guys have, and you've got sick and tired of it. <laughs> um, and then it's sort of like I'm listening to them for a couple of hours and then, like I said, I think just with the gear, even the select pieces of gear that I've got, it's taken me a long time to build a very particular kind of selection of gear to make sure that the, the tracks stand up to, to everybody else's tracks that yeah. are out there. Um, <clears throat> and it's good to have that relationship with the person mastering, so, so sometimes like, Tank will give me feedback on the mix down and I'll go back and change like a certain sound at a certain frequency, which is quite useful. Um, but I think also having a mastering engineer that uses that analogue gear gives it that extra bit of warmth and sparkle that isn't there otherwise. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I agree. I've had similar situations where, you know, records got mastered and it sounds, you know, as Paul said, James said, all of you guys said, you know, gives it the extra 5-10% that the record's missing and it just sounds incredible then when you play it out. I mean, Paul touched on another thing. For me, you know, I get vinyl masters cut sometimes as well. I've been cutting a lot more dub plates again recently and just playing vinyl sets and you know you want a different mix for that so you know yeah it's it's really important okay um we're gonna wrap it up there i'm gonna say uh many thanks to our panelists for today's producer q a and many thanks to all of you for attending <laughs>